Sports Radio. Here we go. Thank you. Appreciate that. No problem. Hold on. Let's do this here. I say this every Tuesday at 1230. I'm Marky Vilson. It's Tri-City Sports Now, 1420 WEMB Sports Radio, Jet Broadcasting Live, or Archive or Live on the most followed Facebook page of any sports talk radio station in the market, 1420 WEMB Sports Radio. So that means it's time for one of the true one of the true journalists covering the Tennessee Volunteers. He's Caleb Calhoun of AllForTennessee.com, which is why I'm wearing my leather face tie today, because AllForTennessee.com kills it every day. And it really is, I think, the best off-season Tennessee Volunteers site. Uh, not tremendous amounts of news. I mean, you've got recruiting and football and all this. It is kind of a slow time and a look-ahead time for Tennessee, but uh, there was the NBA draft, and yeah, there were three basketball players taken, and one of them you had to like how it went out. Admiral Schofield, you're writing for the USA Today when you're not writing for all for Tennessee.com up there in uh, the D.C. suburbs, and well, Admiral Schofield becoming a Washington Wizard. How do, how do you think that panned out? Do you think that this can be, uh, Schofield can be a contributor in the NBA? I do. Um, I think Schofield, oh, excuse me one second. Um, uh, it happens. I think Schofield can be, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Boy, you really are catering that East Tennessee crowd. I mean, allergies and everything, man. I, I you, you got it down right there. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think Schofield can actually be a very uh, solid NBA player. You know, I thought his goal for a while was to be kind of a role player coming off the bench who can give you some three-point shooting, play some defense on the wing, and just be that very solid seventh or eighth guy. But, you know, the Wizards right now don't really have a wing player. Um, Trevor Ariza, his contract is up. And so Schofield could be in contention to start for Washington this year if he has a good summer and he has, if he has a good offseason. So... Watch out for that. Uh, he's going through a very good situation. Um, I think that he's, um, again, it's likely he doesn't start, but I, if, I'm, if I'm being realistic. But I will say that he has, he, he's in a, if he was looking to start, he's going through a very, very good situation in Washington. Can you explain to me uh, at all, I mean, do you have any idea, Caleb Calhoun, why it seemed like so many times, okay, uh, the draft chair, he says, even after they were selected, were dealt away like lottery tickets in a poker game or something like that. I mean, uh, you know, here you had Jordan Bone, he gets selected, and all of a sudden the Sixers trade him to the Pistons, who, yeah, they need another point guard. But uh, it's like, well, we draft this guy for $2 million, really, so that we can get that. I mean, this doesn't happen in the NFL. Why does it happen so much in the NBA? Do you have any insight into that, Caleb Callahan? And I've always wondered what you get out of it when you sell your draft pick for cash. Um, I mean, because, I mean, I don't think really the cap changes. So I, I, it is a soft cap, to be fair. So I'm sure there's some certain rules. But that's, all, that's something that I've always tried to look at myself because I've never understood why teams are out here selling their picks. Maybe they want, you know, likely they want the extra cash to be able to pay, like, a luxury tax if they go over the cap when they sign somebody later or something like that. Because, you know, again, no. it's not like the NFL. It's not a hard cap. So if you go over, you can go over, but you have to pay a luxury tax. I had uh, somebody say that, you know, well, the Pistons, although their media doesn't seem to think that Bourne's Bone somehow is, I mean, they seem to be penciling him being the 12th man on the roster or something, which I'm surprising. But they say, well, we need a, a backup point guard. need another point guard. You just, you know, bought Jordan Bone. How in the world is that not the guy right there? And some, you know, I have been told by some NBA reporters that, it is a little more, what shall we say, acceptable to sort of try to work out a deal with a team. Hey, if you take him, we'll get, we'll buy him from you. We'll, we'll give you a nice deal and all this. Maybe it has to do with the fact that there are only two rounds in the NBA draft. I don't know. But uh, I was a little bit surprised that, yeah, you know, Schofield and Bone did not go to the team that they uh, were drafted by. What do you think of Grant Williams with the Celtics? Uh, can he make an initial impact, in your opinion? Oh, yeah. I, uh, we, we talked uh, last week about how we love Grant Williams with the Celtics. Uh, my co-editor, Billy Wilford, said that they were the best place for him to go to. Um, you know, Boston has, is totally rebuilding now. And they have a couple of, you know, Al Horford now is gone, um, who was their key go-to big man. So they need a little bit of help in the, in the paint, and Greg Williams gives them that. And he's playing for Brad Stevens. And if anybody's going to if anybody's going to learn how to utilize a guy more built for the college game in the NBA, it is Brad Stevens, who took Butler to two national title 
Uh, so I think that Greg Williams couldn't ask for anything better. So it looks like, I mean, as it stands right now, Williams, you like where he's slotted. I happen to think Bone, you know, can make get some initial feet wet uh, there in Detroit. And if nothing else, hey, you can watch uh, Admiral Schofield play in person next year. So, you know, yeah, at least it seems that way. So it works out pretty well for UT basketball. What's the, what's the latest with uh, Kerry Bla Blakeshear? Oh, we have no idea. We're still waiting. And it's driving, I think it's driving everybody crazy. Even if you're not a fan, if you're just covering the team, you're like, can, can he go ahead and make his decision so, like, we can write about it and move on and get to other things for the summer? But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my, my guess, you know, is that he... I think he is just having a really hard time making up his mind. I think a lot of people are getting frustrated by it. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's a big decision when you're 22 years old to figure out where you want to play your last year. So I understand where, what he's going through. Um, but, if you know, if, if I had to pick right now, I'd say he'd either go to Tennessee or stay at Virginia Tech. I just I never hmm. thought Kentucky could offer him what he wanted. Um, and so... I think that I, I, I do think it's down to Tennessee or Virginia Tech at this point, particularly since he canceled his visit to College Station over the weekend, according to reports. That's kind of intriguing, right, Dick? That's his former coach, Buzz Williams, down there at Texas A and M, and uh, you know Mike Young coming in uh, there at uh, at Virginia Tech. And I've noticed some of the players that Mike Young has brought in. You know, they talk about the recruiting class, and I'm sort of like, I'm not sure that this is up to the standards of a Sweet Sixteen team. So, you know, I've talked about for Tennessee to have a season like they did last year. And maybe, you know, 31 victories is a lot to ask, but a return to the Sweet 16. Challenging for the SEC championship. I think they need Kerry. I think the same thing could be said, though, about Virginia Tech. I, you know, I, I think that he's going to be wherever, if he goes to one of those two schools, big man on campus. Um, see what we have right there. Uh, we're talking to Caleb Calhoun. This is Asian House Vols Talk with Caleb Calhoun of AllForTennessee.com, which I think because at this time of year especially, the wonderful, wonderful list stories he does. You know, these are uh, the greatest uh, come-from-behind victories in Tennessee history or the most impactful loss or something of this nature. I mean, it really, who are the greatest junior quarterbacks? What's the greatest junior season a QB ever had? What with Jared Guarantano uh, coming into his junior season? season. I guess we haven't talked a uh, enough about that. Uh, just standard question as we look ahead to football. Uh, how do you think Guarantano is going to do? New offensive coordinator uh, Cheney seems to be yeah, just what the doctor ordered, but still it has just seemed for the last two years there's something missing. Uh, what do you look for for Guarantano his junior year? I mean, I think that there has been way too much obsessing over how efficient he was last year. And I'm like, yeah, like, okay, I get it. He had a 4-1 to touchdown to interception ratio, but he threw 12 touchdowns. Like, that's, that, by no yeah. standard is that a good number. <laughs> and, and you, know, I, you know, it was an offense that was outside of the top 100. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm saying all this, and I want to be fair to him and the offense. I, you know, there were a lot of deeper issues that were going on in the offense last year. So I don't want to sit there and say this is the reason to cut state with Garantano, but I do say it's the reason to stop pouting how efficient he was last year. Um, because I, I didn't see it as much. I you know, he's getting a lot of he's getting a lot of draft type, you know, people like Pro Football Focus keep rating him high in the SEC and things like that. But again, it, it you know, I I didn't with the touch of the Auburn game, I'll give him that one. I didn't really see him aggressively make plays throughout the year. And I thought that was kind of yeah. problematic. And right after the Auburn game, the South Carolina game, the ball was put in his hands again in the fourth quarter, and he just couldn't do much. I know there were issues on the offensive line at that point with Trey Smith getting hurt. And there is advanced metrics to show that the offensive line was historically bad last year. But at the same time, I still saw him start to miss a few deep throws down the field later in the season. So I think he's got a lot of, I think he's got a lot of potential. I think Jim Cheney's great for him. But I don't – I'm not all, all in on – on saying how, on bragging about how efficient he was last year. It seems to me, Caleb Calhoun of All for Tennessee, that he was not asked to be the running quarterback that he was under Butch Jones, that he was really recruited to be. Now, 
I happen to like that. I mean, I'm still like the drop back passer. I think that, you know, yeah, when you're scrambling, the it's a broken play and you're seven yards behind the line of scrimmage to start. And, you know, for every time you break off a long one, you're risking a, a sack or your quarterback to get hurt, you know, a la, let's say, Jerry Colquitt from the old days. But uh, where I'm going with this is, do you want to see Guarantano be more of that dual threat this year? Or, look, uh, if he's really going to develop as a quarterback, he's got to learn how to throw the deep ball, et cetera, et cetera. What Guarantano would you like to see in 2019? I think in 2019, I'd rather see the drop back passer with Jim Cheney calling the plays. You know, Jim Cheney's always thrived with more of the drop back passer, and particularly quarterbacks with big arms. Um, I've seen Jared, uh, sorry, I've seen Jared Garantano and his arm strength. He has shown himself in the past to have a big arm, and so I think that he's kind of the prototypical quarterback Jim Cheney likes to work with. Um, I haven't really seen Cheney work with as many, I guess, should you say, dual threat quarterbacks in the past. So. That you know, maybe maybe he did during his days at Purdue, but all I remember from his Purdue days is Drew Brees. So, well, that's not bad, putting up Drew Brees. I mean, you know, I don't know if we if uh, Guarantano is going to be Drew Brees. I'd kind of bet. Ag- I think I would bet against it, but uh, at the same time, that's quite the yeah, tutelage. Drop back passer too. Yes, yes, exactly. That's quite the tutelage. Yes, that's one of the reasons why. I mean, uh, if you have tutelage like that, it's why I said, look, if I could go anywhere to play quarterback in college football, and they would accept me in, I think I'd go to Duke to work with uh, David Cutcliffe, play a pretty tough schedule, and I'd be challenged. Uh, cerebral, uh, you know, academically too, and a lot of great quarterbacks come from uh, really good academic schools, in my opinion, and such. I think that Caleb Calhoun is pretty academically minded, or at least intelligent. Hey, I think he's proven that himself, and that means that if he was in Johnson City or the Tri Cities right now, or Irwin. He'd be going to lunch at Asian House. It begins at five ninety nine, and they'll even take ten percent off of that. If you mention my name, Marky Bilson, back with more Caleb Calhoun, all for Tennessee.com, Balls Talk, sponsored by Asian House after this. Asian House, home of the happy box.